Jean-Francois Belize. Very well, welcome to Digital Markets Research Hub. It's an absolute pleasure to have an opportunity to discuss with you the, the latest development in EU competition law and policy, but maybe we can also have a look at the history of, of this really exciting field, which we all adore so much. And uh, everybody who examines your your CV, your profile, will notice the obvious that you are managing partner in, in one of the most influential uh, Brussels law firm for 38 years. So you are into this business for quite a long time. You observe the trends, you predict the trends, and maybe we can ask you as a start to, uh, as a start to trace the evolution of, of EU competition law, the key periods and the trajectory of its further development. Yeah. No, thank you for inviting me to uh, to, to answer your, your questions. Concerning the managing partner, no, I've been managing partner for a long time, but currently it's somebody else. So, but uh, I'm still, of course, in my firm, but uh, management is in uh, other uh, able hands. Um, now, coming to well, my my evolution and the evolution of EU competition law, uh, my first case, in fact, was a long time ago, uh, 1975. Uh, that uh, February 1975, that was my first appeal that I brought physically uh, to the Court of Justice together with my uh, uh, partner and friend, uh, Ivo van Baal, and that was United Brands, which was seen as a big case at the time with a big fine. It was one million EQ, so like one million euro, which was big at that time. Today, it would be seen uh, like a symbolic fine. And uh, it was abuse of dominance. Um, and uh, it was the first case in which the commission really reduced the level at which dominance could be found. All the previous cases had been cases involving monopolies or quasi-monopolies, 80% market share. But here, for the first time, you had the case where the market share was 45%. Um, in the market, uh, which was somewhat questionable, bananas, because there was evidence of cross-elasticity of demand with other fruit uh, provided by official reports of the FAO which were ignored, uh, but the market share was 45%. And um, the next competitor was at 18%. The next one was 16%. And so, in effect, what the Commission did in that case was to transform the concept of dominance, which I think was understood initially by the um, uh, the authors of the treaty, um, the drafters of the treaty as well, monopoly or quasi-monopoly, was reduced to something which was in fact uh, preeminent. Uh, all you needed to be dominant was to have at least 40-45% in the market and be uh, much bigger than your next competitor. Uh, if, you, if you were in a, in a duopoly, uh, with a company having the same market share, you would not be regarded as dominant. And this was very clear, for example, from one of the markets in the uh, Hoffman La Roche vitamin case, where uh, in one vitamin market, um, Hoffman La Roche at 50%, and another pharmaceutical company at also 50%. And so that was a, a market in which Hoffman La Roche was not uh, regarded uh, to be dominant. So the, the level of dominance was uh, dramatically uh, reduced. And then, of course, uh, what was interesting in that case was the finding of uh, pricing abuse. And that era, the mid 70s, presents some features of the current era, um, um, of course, which more dramatic than today in terms of inflation. The mid 70s were a period of high inflation and rising inflation. This was a new phenomenon in uh, the world at that time. 
And so if everybody was trying to find a way to reduce inflation, the German Bundeskartellamt um, uh, had uh, started a number of proceedings where they try to define what would be a competitive price uh, and using the concept of uh, as, uh, as if competition, as obvet bever, then they would uh, then determine what should have been the price that the company should have charged if it had been in a competitive market. And so it's, it, it is in that context that the Commission brought the United Brands case, uh, where one of the abuses was the fact that the prices for Chiquita bananas were uh, too expensive by 30%, about 30%. So this was really one of the key uh, uh, findings of abuse. And this is a, a finding of abuse which the court annulled. So in that case, we achieve something that many people around me uh, said, well, it's a success. You have succeeded in obtaining a finding from the court that the commission was wrong on a key finding of abuse. But uh, quite frankly, I was personally extremely disappointed uh, with the result of that case because I thought naively at the time uh, probably that the market had not been correctly defined, that there was really no dominant position. Uh, United Brands was not able to behave independently of its uh, competitors or customers. And still three findings of abuse survived. The fine was reduced, but only slightly uh, 15%. And this was my first uh, encounter uh, at a very young age uh, with EU competition law and with the court. And um, so I was puzzled by the court. And I was also, as I said, very disappointed with the outcome of the United Brands case. And I was wondering whether I should stay in that line of business, because I thought that, well, no matter how good your arguments are, it looks as if you know they don't register. What is that institution? But fortunately, at the same time, we were working on the case which um, help putting me back on the saddle, which was uh, uh, BP, a case that everybody has forgotten. Also a case very much in line with the, of course, the mood at the time and also the mood a few years ago uh, when we were uh, hearing about risks of shortages of uh, um, uh, energy, uh, etc. And BP was exactly that. So the fact that um, in the Netherlands, um, uh, the big oil companies uh, had, uh, especially BP, had uh, organized a system under which, because of the shortage of supplies, uh, they would only supply their existing regular customers, uh, not the spot customers, and a spot customer complained, the commission uh, uh considered that this was uh, abusive we went to court we represented uh, bp and in that case we had an opinion by advocate general warner which came very soon after the united brands judgment where he found that there was no um, the market had not been correctly defined there was no dominant position there was no abuse so uh, we should win on all points. Uh, the court um, annulled the commission decision on a narrower basis. But then I thought, well, sometimes it's possible to win in that court. Um, and so let's let's uh, well let's stay in the same line of uh, of business, which I did. But then uh, one year later, United Brands. I still remember the date, it was Valentine's Day, 1978. And at the end of 79, uh, I received a call from Michel Walbrook, who had been my professor. And uh, he said, um, at the Court of Justice, uh, the judges are looking for uh, a second referende, a second law clerk. Uh, because before that, each judge had one uh, law clerk, usually uh, same nationality. 
but here they were um, given um, the budget for a second law clerk, preferably not of the same nationality, and a British judge, in fact, a Scottish judge, uh, Lord Mackenzie Stewart, was looking for a second law clerk with whom he could speak in English, uh, but who would be able to write in French. Because the court at that time, and this is still the case today, is producing everything in French. Um, and so I, I, I was very excited by that uh, proposal because I really wanted to see from the inside how that institution worked. Now, it was a problem for Ivo because I was half of the EU <laughs> uh, competition law department at the time, but well, very generously, he allowed me to take a leave of absence. And so I spent some time at the court. So that was uh, 80, 1980, 1981, uh, where I could see how the court was working, what was the what were the dynamics, uh, and it was a very interesting uh, uh, learning uh, experience. I could understand better well how that uh, institution uh, was uh, was was working. Uh, Mackenzie Stewart wanted me to stay three years, but Ivo, after a year and a half, said, now it's time for you to come back. Um, and so I, I did. And then uh, we, together, Ivo and I, plunged into uh, a few interesting cases. We acted for two complainants in the IBM case. Um, and so that was very interesting. This was a case where, um, where IBM was like uh, Google today, Microsoft uh, 10 years ago, a company which each antitrust authority in the world wanted to have as a scalp on its uh, walls. Um, and in fact, uh, the commission had uh, solicited complaints in the US they had actively visited the US to join the battle against uh, IBM, which had been raging in the US for a little while. And uh, there were two complainants, Memorex and uh, Amdal. Uh, there were additional ones, but these, these were the two main ones, and we represented them. And it was very interesting to be on the, the other side, because I've been usually uh, representing defendants, but it was interesting to work for complainants, and especially in a case where uh, IBM had an army of lawyers, an army of uh, economists, an army of engineers, and on the other side, uh, the commission had, well, one engineer, um, well, who was really <laughs> not at the same level as the IBM engineers. And on our side, well, we brought um, um, a very uh, dynamic young engineer from uh, uh, California um, who uh, played a very big role as far as the technical aspects of the case are concerned. But it was really one, one, one guy you who know, was constantly flying between California and Brussels. And well, if IBM could have known that you know, facing its army of uh, experts in of all disciplines, there was this, uh, I wouldn't say, you know, a man and a dog, but uh, this team of just a few uh, officials, a few lawyers, uh, and essentially one, one uh, engineer uh, from, from the US, um, uh, so to debunk all the uh, uh, technical arguments that they were putting forward. So very interesting case, also uh, very political, which uh, like many cases uh, where complainants are involved uh, and not really satisfactory for the complainant, because at one point in the case, the commission starts developing interests which do not necessarily coincide with those of the complainant. And so the case was settled. At that time, there was no official procedure for settlement, but there was an informal 
settlement to which uh, IBM adhered. Um, so it, it worked, uh, but not uh, well enough uh, to allow companies like Memorex and Amdal to, uh, to, to survive. So that was a very interesting case. Um, again, a, a very famous um, uh, target. And at the same time also, we worked on the first Michelin uh, case. Um, the first, uh, which at the time the fines were really low. I mean, the fine imposed on, 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 on Michelin was a few million uh, 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 euros. Um, and uh, this was the first case, the first Michelin case involving um, exclusivity. Well, it was not exclusivity, it was target rebates, um, where the commission and the court developed this theory of harm about those rebates which were given on a yearly basis. Uh, and the theory of harm was that the incentive to reach the target uh, in fact, there were three targets, um, and of course, with each uh, target, there was a higher uh, rebate. So the incentive to reach the next target was so high that at the end of the year, the customer would have only one thing in mind, not Christmas, not uh, New Year, reaching the target to get this extra bonus, which would apply to 100% of the purchases of the year. So that was the theory of harm. Um, so, well, in the Intel case, <laughs> the fact that um, the uh, the as efficient competitor test, the AEC test was developed, was for me a welcome um, innovation because before that you had a theory of harm which assumed that the customer was uh, negligent or and somewhat stupid. Uh, he could not uh, compute an average, and so he was. Uh, for, you know, he only thought about the Michelin target, the first of December, and so at that point, the only thing he was thinking about was to buy Michelin tires. I mean, that was a somewhat ridiculous theory of harm, and I think that what has been done in Intel is certainly much more intelligent and much more perceptive. So these were two big cases at the time. Um, and then as the 80s uh, um, um, developed, um, of course, we, we had uh, more cases. We had AXO, uh, in which I was, I was personally uh, less involved. That was a big case also for, for the firm uh, with um, um, in fact, uh, the as efficient competitor concept being introduced uh, in the sense that uh, the uh, the abuses the abusive practice consisted in AXO um, uh, offering prices which were uh, lower than its uh, uh, weighted uh, um, uh, cost for. Um, 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 on the the weighted uh, average uh, cost for uh, you know the costs which were linked to uh, to 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 the sales. So the AXO case was interesting because this was the the first time the commission was uh, in fact applying a kind of as efficient competitor test, relying on uh, AXO actual cost. Uh, to determine whether the prices charged by AXO were or not uh, equal or higher than its uh, uh, weighted average variable costs. Uh, of course, there was the exception. Um, the Commission could rely on total costs if there was evidence of a plan to eliminate competition. But so this was the, the first case in which uh, the Commission applied um, a price cost test based on the cost of the company accused of, uh, of abuse. Um, now, this was also the first time that the Commission was relying on uh, uh, economic concepts and um, 
uh, evidence of an economic nature before that uh, within DG, well, four, as it was then called, um, there were very few economists, practically none. Um, the staff was essentially uh, lawyers and uh, companies rarely uh, relied on economists. Uh, and uh, so it was a very different um, um, context than, than, than today. Um, and this is personally something that I appreciate in what has happened in the last 20, 25 years, the, the, the intervention of economists, which I think introduce uh, more rationality in some of the uh, legal theories that were developed uh, previously, because, for example, when you think about uh, Michelin, the Michelin one, and then the Michelin two case, which uh, started in the early 90s, so 10 years after the, the previous one, um, there didn't seem to be any real economic uh, logic uh, supporting them. It was more like a, a legal logic. Um, in the Michelin one case, the commission had gone after um, target rebates, which were um, discriminatory, but the court accepted that discrimination because uh, the discrimination in Michelin one meant that the um, rebate offered to a small dealer who could only buy well, 100 tires a year was the same as that offered to a big dealer uh, who would, was able to buy 1,000 tires. And so the targets were adjusted. Uh, it was the same rebate, but different targets. And the court uh, found that this discrimination was, was acceptable because it uh, allowed small dealers to obtain the same rebate as big dealers. Um, but then Michelin II uh, was about a system of rebates where there was no, no discrimination. It was one scale of rebate uh, applicable to all with many steps, I think 37 steps, something like that. And uh, uh, the logic uh, pursued by the commission was a, a legal logic, so expanding the law. Uh, not just initially exclusivity rebates for um, that was Hoffman La Roche, then target rebate that was Michelin 1, and uh, well, rebates which are um, of a general application, uh, Michelin 2, that was the next step in the evolution of that uh, legal theory. And there was really no, we tried to introduce some economic analysis. We had an economist. Uh, uh, producing a report in Michelin II, but he was uh, ignored. But uh, more uh, importantly, I would say, um, there was evidence in Michelin II that uh, these rebates had no exclusionary effect. Because the Commission sent uh, a request for information to Michelin's competitors, asking whether they uh, had uh, an issue with Michelin's uh, rebate practices. And the unanimous answer was no. In fact, they all said we are doing the same thing and we don't mind uh, those Michelin's rebate. So there was evidence of absence of uh, exclusionary uh, effect. And in fact, in, in both cases, the complaint was filed uh, not by a competitor in the market identified by the commission, by, but by uh, somebody else. For example, Michelin Wand, at the, the origin of the case, you had a complaint by an association of dealers who were complaining that Michelin had bought um, a dealer a dealership uh, in the Netherlands. So they were concerned about that competition at the level of uh, retail. And, uh, not at uh, the level of uh, the sale of tire um, the, of tires, uh, and in Michelin II, uh, the complainant was uh, a company called Bandag, a U.S. company uh, specialized in the retreading of tires, 
So they were not selling new tires, where the abuse took place. Uh, they were uh, involved in retreading. And uh, in fact, their complaint was um, retaliation for Michelin's entry into the US market for uh, cold retreading, uh, in which Bandak was the market leader. Um, so again, uh, the complaint was not filed by a competitor selling uh, truck tires in the French market. It was uh, another interested party having uh, an axe to grind with, uh, uh, with Michelin. And so these were cases where you could really question the exclusionary nature and, and effect of the, of the practice. Um, and so this is why I, I really uh, welcome uh, this uh, big development that occurred in the year 2000, uh, first, uh, well, the modernization. Modernization started with Article 101, uh, the Commission having grown tired of uh, having this uh, very broad interpretation of uh, the concept of restriction of competition under, under Article 101, which uh, was so broad that it covered any restriction on the freedom of action. Of a, of a party, so which meant that practically all commercial agreements were uh, a restriction of competition, even a mere exclusivity arrangement, because the manufacturer undertook not to appoint other dealers, so he restricted his uh, freedom of action. That was enough for this to be a restriction of competition. And the result was that the, the balancing of the pro and anti-competitive uh, aspects of the, the agreement was done under paragraph three, uh, which the commission had exclusive power to apply. So it was a very clever approach developed by the commission at a time where it was not clear exactly what the commission could do with this power to enforce Article 85 and Article 86. Um, and uh, it uh, cleverly turned it into uh, uh, into something that uh, Professor Nicola Petit called contractual engineering. So using Article 85 um, to force companies to amend their contract, deleting clauses that the Commission didn't like uh, in the 60s and the 70s, all the clauses that made parallel trade between member states more difficult or sometimes impossible, to force companies in Europe to uh, amend their contracts to eliminate provisions which were inconsistent with the objective of uh, creating the common market. So export bans, import bans, uh, resale price maintenance also was added to that list. Uh, so this was a very clever approach, but a very burdensome one. Uh, because the Commission had to deal with lots of contracts which uh, really raised no big competition law issues. Uh, it could not exempt each contract, so it developed uh, the, uh, this uh, very famous, typically uh, European institution, the block exemption, which was a catalog of, uh, uh, of all the clauses that you could lawfully uh, introduce um, in a contract uh, the ones that uh, you could not uh, uh, introduce in a contract, and then an intermediate category of uh, gray clauses, which had uh, um, an ambiguous uh, status. Uh, and these book exemptions were, in fact, developing um, a template for contractual commercial agreements in uh, um, of like uh, exclusivity agreements, uh, um, 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 franchising agreements, etc., uh, licensing agreements. Uh, so very common uh, agreements, which uh, whose content was defined by the Commission. Um, and for the rest, uh, there was the uh, uh, institution of uh, comfort letters, which the Commission issued to 
uh, well, quickly get rid of agreements which on their face uh, did not uh, raise problems uh, and were not exempted by one of the block exemptions. But this enormous amount of work is something that even the Commission eventually found to be uh, too much. And so in the late, and the Commission realized also in the mid 90s that it was applying a form of competition law which had no equivalent in the world. I mean, a very strange uh, competition law which looked more like a, a law of uh, abusive contractual clauses than a real uh, competition law. And so also it was concerned about uh, enlargement um, and the additional burden that the that very formalistic system uh, would create. And so there was the modernization for Article 101, which, uh, in my opinion, had the effect of, in fact, making paragraph three of Article 101 obsolete. Because in the past, paragraph three was everything, because everything was a restriction of competition almost. So all the interesting debates were taking place within the context of paragraph three. But once the Commission um, decided to abandon its monopoly over paragraph three and uh, said that essentially anybody could now apply paragraph three, member state authorities, member state courts, etc. In fact, uh, paradoxically, now that everybody could use it, uh, in fact, it had become useless because the balancing was now taking place within paragraph one. And so a very interesting document is this, uh, uh, the first uh, guidelines on the uh, application. Uh, it's, it's a funny title. It's on the application of Article uh, 85, paragraph three, and uh, in which the commission explains how paragraph three should be applied. And in fact, they develop a uh, test, which, you know, essentially in economic language. So uh, uh, the, the benefits become uh, efficiency gains, all the language of an economist, very complicated test. Um, uh, but uh, even though the guidelines uh, are called guidelines on the application of Article 85, Paragraph 3, at that point, the Commission stops applying it. After 2004, there is not one single Commission decision still applying uh, uh, paragraph three. I don't think that the member states have applied it uh, either. Um, and uh, it's and, and it's it, it's 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 logical. It's a uh, it's the necessary consequence of the new approach, in which paragraph one is construed, in fact, very much like uh, Section 1 of the Sherman Act. So, um, well, standard uh, mainstream uh, antitrust, where, um, of course, we don't use the, the terms rule of reason, uh, but in fact, this is what is happening. So the, the, the definition of what is um, a competition, a restriction by object, incidentally, this concept by object, by effect, date back from 2004. Uh, it's in those guidelines on the application of Article uh, 85, Paragraph 3, that the Commission developed uh, this notion of uh, um, restrictions by object uh, and by effect. Um, and uh, when you read uh, those guidelines, you see that they develop uh, the idea that you have to look at the actual impact uh, of the uh, restriction on the on the market, and uh, in fact they develop an approach which is the approach which the court uh, upheld in cases like uh, carte bancaire and all the cases that that followed. So a more economic approach, which makes paragraph three a necessary, because the balancing of all the good and bad aspects of the agreement is now done under uh, paragraph one. So that's the first aspect of modernization 
So the transformation of um, Article 101, and I use this uh, this number also to uh, it applies to well all the previous numbers that it said 85, 81. So it's the same the same provision. So the transformation of uh, Article 101 uh, into uh, an article where Paragraph 3 has become de facto obsolete, uh, a dead letter, uh, and you um, then apply, you approach the, the issue of restriction of competi competition in a more economic way, in fact, in a more standard way. Uh, so making then the application of Article 101 very comparable to uh, that of Section 1 of the Sherman Act in the in the US. So this special, uh, uh, what I had called in an article, uh, this uh, um, um, well, European idiosyncrasy <laughs> uh, disappeared uh, with, uh, with modernization. So Article 101 became a standard antitrust provision. But then there was 102. Uh, and the idea initially was to leave 102 untouched. And there were vested interests in that status quo, um, especially the legal service, because the legal service had an easy time winning uh, its cases on the basis of the very uh, well rudimentary legal logic developed uh, in the in uh, all those cases, um, you know, my, my myself, uh, I've been involved in, in a number of Article 102 uh, cases over the years, but the last one before Intel, uh, in which um, we won uh, at a court level on an issue other, you know, on a, on a substantive issue was uh, 1979, the Hogan case. Um, a case that everybody has forgotten. Uh, but after that, not just us, but nobody won a case on substantive grounds, a case involving an abuse of dominance on substantive grounds until Intel, which was quickly followed by Qualcomm. Uh, so for that well, more than 30 years, uh, the legal service of the commission had uh, an easy time. They were winning all their cases. And so they realized that if uh, economic analysis was introduced in the definition of what, what is an abuse, the risk of committing errors, of uh, omitting things uh, was much higher. And so the risk of, of losing in court because of... Uh, uh, an error made in the application of that more economic uh, uh, approach. So they resisted. Inside the commission also, there were some elements, uh, a faction who was uh, in favor of the status quo. And then there was this battle which uh, resulted in um, the famous uh, guidance paper. Um, and uh, concerning the guidance paper, uh, I realized how important that term was and how carefully it had been chosen. Because in uh, uh, 2007, I was chairing uh, a, a panel at, uh, at the Fordham uh, uh, Law School conference. Uh, that conference, it always attracted um, commission officials, including commissioners, and, and several uh, big announcements uh, were made at that uh, conference by various uh, commissioners. And that year, um, the panel I was uh, chairing um, would have as the main speaker uh, Nelly Cruz. And well, we didn't know. We there was a kind of uh, uh, you know well mystery about what the topic uh, she would cover was. And one week before the panel, uh, we are told that it will be one or two. Um, and 
so she she makes her speech and you know we're very interested in hearing the speech and she was announcing the guidance paper um and um so after the presentation she comes back uh, to the table and she was sitting next to me to my left and um i'd been told to make you know say a few words and um, because then after that she had to leave and so um so i said well um thank you very much we are um you know, for this very interesting speech and the the good news is that uh, we are now going to have guidelines i had just uttered that word she grabbed my left uh, arm and said no not not guidelines guidance so, well, we, we will we'll be very happy now to have uh, guidance on the abuses of of dominant and and <laughs> I thought, what a mistake I made. She must have thought, what an idiot. And I spent all my speech explaining it was not guidelines, but guidance. And all he finds to say is guidelines. And indeed, uh, it was guidance because this paper was not meant to change the law. It was, uh, in fact, uh, meant to uh, appease the economist uh, camp uh, there would be economic analysis um, um, and um, uh, but it would not count it would be done exclusively to see whether the case should be brought uh, but uh, it's not supposed to change the law the law remains the same so very formalistic uh, so no risk in engaging in economic games and um, that approach of economic economic analysis just being a game that the economist can play but with total impunity because it will not affect the outcome in court is reflected in the intel decision um, which was adopted in uh, 2009 where you very long decision uh, but middle part 150 pages of economic analysis uh, which is uh, um, introduced by the warning you know all of this doesn't count we did this just to see whether this case met our priorities but it's not part of our legal reasoning um, and that case is very interesting because well it goes to the general court where um, every single point raised is dismissed so very thorough judgment so every single point is dismissed in that case we appear as uh, lawyers for act uh, an association uh, supporting uh, uh, intel and so everything uh, that is submitted is rejected and then the case goes to the court of justice um, and um, where we have advocate general val so that that was lucky <laughs> because uh, well compared to some other advocate generals uh, at the court with, whom i will not name uh, he tended to issue opinions which were very balanced and not necessarily supportive of the commission um, and then uh, another surprise grand chamber so um, uh, not just a, a, a chamber of five the grand chamber and then when you and, and of course we are extremely surprised by by the judgment My, i'd been waiting for something like this you know since 1979 and i could see that in my lifetime finally uh, i would uh, be in a case where an abuse of dominance um, a finding of abuse of dominance may be annulled by the court because the court of justice did not annul the commission decision it sent the case back to the general court but still it was a, a big surprise and when you read the intel judgment it's very interesting because the court well acknowledges that on uh, rebates you have hoffman laroche 
it's the court does not say that of Manaroche is overruled, but it comes very close to that by saying that it must be it must be clarified. And then it says when the company um, in fact offers evidence that its practice will not um, uh, restrict uh, competition, then the commission is required to engage. And then there is a list of factors which the commission must uh, consider in analyzing the practice to see whether the uh, um, the conduct of the dominant company may um, uh, have a negative impact on uh, an as efficient uh, competitor. And it's very interesting because this corresponds exactly to what happened in the Intel proceeding. In the Intel case, Intel's economists, especially one uh, of them, Carl Shapiro, a very famous economist, produced uh, economic analysis, which the economist on the commission side, uh, at that time the, the team was headed by uh, Damien Neven, um, um, found and they found this interesting. And so the exchange, there were very extensive exchanges between these two teams of economists. In fact, they were they were playing, you know, economic games, um, and uh, uh, they did that, especially on the commission side. Well, with a great, uh, you know, well, relaxation because they, they they thought that this would not count. This would just for fun, you know, uh, not uh, for to show that, in fact, if you would choose the economic analysis uh, approach, you would arrive at the same result as uh, you reach by applying the formalistic approach. But it was not supposed to count. And the big surprise is the Court of Justice saying, well, uh, this played an important role. Uh, and so it is legally and judicially reviewable. Uh, and it's very interesting because in the commission decision, this was not part of the reasoning. Now, in the general court judgment, which dismissed all the uh, um, arguments raised by Intel and ACT, the economic analysis was not also part of the reasoning. It was it's a te technical term. In English, it uh, reads for the sake of completeness. In French, it's a little bit clearer, a titre surabondant. So, which means that this is something which is not supposed like an obiter dictum, not supposed to uh, provide support for the conclusion reached by the court. So it's it, in, it is in that part of the general court judgment that the general court quickly, after having quickly reviewed Intel's uh, arguments and having dismissed them, you know, one by one, stops at the AEC test. And, and I know why, because um, I attended uh, the uh, um, the um, the closed session, of course, as a party to the case, the closed session in which uh, the Commission uh, and uh, Intel um, um, uh, argued about the AC test applied in the Intel decision. And well, at that point, I felt uh, compassion <laughs> and almost sympathy for the Commission officials because it was clear they had a hard time explaining everything that had been done there were quarters missing in the analysis so there were many approximations which they had a hard time justifying um, and the whole thing looked so confused that uh, i think the general court thought that even for the sake of completeness they would not touch that aec test issue with a one mile pole and they said well anyway it doesn't count because it's not in the reasoning of the decision so we don't touch it and it's that point specific point which is relied on by the court of justice to say well you should have 
the AC test played an important role in the in the case. Uh, you should have reviewed it. And so you we handle your judgment so that you and look at your at the, the arguments raised by Intel showing that there were big mistakes, there were mistakes in the application of the AC test. So something, the game which we, which was played between the two teams of economists with you know total impunity, the commission thought, in fact was used by was relied on by the court to in fact uh, annul the the fact that the general court had not reviewed this to annul the general court judgment to send the case back to the general court which of course at that point had no choice but to annul the commission decision first there was the fact that the commission decision did not reflect Hoffman La Roche as clarified by the court uh, it was still based on Hoffman La Roche, uh, the formalistic approach. And then, well, the court had instructed the general court to look at the errors in the AC test. And, and, and well, they had no choice but, but to annul the commission uh, decision. So that was in, uh, in 22, two, two years ago, a case which is now pending before the, the Court of Justice, the commission challenging the, the standard of proof applied by, by the general court. But so Intel really illustrates um, um, all the problems with the guidance paper and also shows the futility of you know, having economic analysis, which is there just for show, uh, which doesn't count. Um, it, uh, uh, essentially, the, the, the court called the commission's bluff. Um, and so, hence, this uh, current effort to replace the, the guidance paper with true guidelines and maybe uh, uh, of a different form or, or slightly different uh, content, knowing that it matters. It's not just uh, for sure. And how much? Flexibility, do you think the the commission uh, has uh, with uh, issuing uh, the, the the new guidelines? Can can it somehow rechannel the development of future cases? Of course, we will see how things will go. But um, economic analysis has become part of uh, the uh, current enforcement of uh, EU competition law. And I don't think that the Commission is really uh, planning to uh, to change that. Uh, it hasn't fired its uh, team of economists and the chief economist is still uh, firmly uh, in place uh, as a function. Um, so there will, and, and there are, and, and there is a lot of also, there are a lot of common sense reasons for maintaining this, this approach before finding that uh, a course of conduct is illegal. Really, you must be sure that you are doing the, the right thing. And that was the problem with the uh, the approach in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, but of course, uh, economic ideas may, may evolve. And for example, concerning the this famous uh, AEC test, which has been uh, criticized so much um, by some officials in the commission, also by some uh, national um, enforcement authorities like the, the, the Bundeskartelamt. Um, I think that for rebates, there is a, an issue with uh, one element of the test, which in fact is not really AC. AC means that it's it's a it's a it's a standard of uh, of uh, of proof of evidence, which relies on um, elements which the dominant company can determine itself, so that the dominant company can determine whether its its prices are abusive because you have there is a cost standard and you rely on the costs of the dominant company and you assume that 
uh, the competitor, which may be the victim of the practice, is as efficient as the dominant company, uh, just to make it possible for the company to, to know exactly where it goes wrong by using its own cost. And so it works very well for predatory pricing because you have only costs uh, coming from the dominant company. It works for margin squeeze. Of course, there are problems of cost allocations, etc. So uh, th there is room for uh, debate sometimes. But at least you use costs which the dominant company knows. In when you apply the AC test for rebates, there is one element which the dominant company cannot know for sure, and perhaps that nobody can know for sure, which is the contestable share of demand of the customer. How, that's a key element of the test, which is a, a predatory pricing test, but where the rebate, the 100% of the rebate is allocated to the share of the demand, the customer's demand, which the customer is uh, prepared to shift to the competitor or competitors of the dominant company. Uh, that's really the key, key factor. But how can you determine how much a customer will want to shift to a competitor of the dominant company? In Intel, there was this famous uh, uh, well aspect of the 2022 judgment, which the commission has criticized, that for uh, one customer, if the contestable share is 8%, the rebates are unlawful because they are below variable cost. But if the contestable share is slightly bigger, 11%, then the, the it's okay because the, the price is above cost. So how do you determine how much the customer will want to shift? Uh, you need to know what the customer is thinking and maybe he or she doesn't know himself or herself. Maybe if the price is good, offered by the company is good, maybe, uh, you know, well, less will be shifted. Uh, um, uh, and so how can you know that? It's impossible. So the commission will itself, of course, engage in, in that game uh, um, and by trying to to find out through internal, um, by looking at internal uh, documents of the, the customer, you know, how much they were prepared to, to shift, but, but they are ambiguous because even within the customer, and especially the customer who was at stake in uh, uh, that uh, discussion before the court, uh, there were two camps, you know, a camp which wanted to buy uh, more from uh, from Intel, uh, another one who wanted to test uh, AMD, and so different numbers were uh, considered. It's really impossible to know. So, for that aspect of the test, there should be another way of determining the number by a presumption, or uh, so that that's something that should that should be fixed. Uh, but this is not a reason to discard the AC test completely, because then what is the theory of harm for, for rebates? Because it was really ridiculous uh, this to have this tough test for um, exclusivity rebates, because those rebates, after all, were nothing but an incentive to achieve exclusivity. And the general court uh, said that well, they are illegal per se, regardless of the share of the market that they cover. I mean, all you need to show is the condi conditionality on exclusivity. But if you are you have an exclusivity arrangement by a dominant company, uh, it's not per se illegal. You look at the share of the market, which is covered by the exclusivity practice. So there, you know, the market coverage matters. Why should it not matter when you have a rebate, an exclusive, exclusivity rebate, which is just an incentive to reach exclusivity? So it should not be treated should not be treated more harshly than exclusivity itself, 
and I would say should be treated less harshly because it's only an incentive. It will not necessarily work. And that's uh, where the AAC test comes into play to see whether that uh, rebate could work as, in fact, well, de facto uh, leading to exclusivity because the, the competitor cannot match the, the rebate. And this is essentially a work in progress. We will see this year in the following years uh, where uh, where it will develop in the next yes. uh, wave of cases. But I wanted also to ask you about the, the newly emerged regime, Digital Markets Act regime. You somehow sense what is in the air in, 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 in Brussels, in, in Luxembourg and in other important places in, uh, surrounding the, the, this new regime. We already see the first wave of litigation of challenging the, the designation decisions themselves. If you try to somehow to imagine where it will develop, some say that it will be very lit litigious process, despite all the efforts being made to make it very pro-enforcement and uh, making the job of the, the, the informal regulators, whatever the name would suit better to this new regime, uh, relatively easier to somehow to do a shortcut, abandoning this uh, e economic labyrinth of, of, of analysis and making it policy making rather than uh, kind of truth discovering endeavor. Will will the enforcement succeed on this on this mission or it will be also somehow overly or not overly, very litigious. Yes, I think it will continue to be litigious, um, but in a very different way, which which will make the commission's job easier. Um, but before going into this, you know, this effort reminds me of well, the situation in the 60s, 70s, where you had regulation for Article 101 the block exemption we're telling you exactly you can do a b c d but not uh, uh, a b c d uh, in the other list etc and in uh, me and for the uh, uh, other uh, list of other provisions you have to come and and uh, and uh, notify <clears throat> to us and if we don't react it's okay so it was also in fact a regulatory approach um, uh, and uh, now this is being done for the digital sector, and I understand the uh, um, the rationale behind that effort, because uh, when you see cases like the, the Google case, even even the, the Microsoft case, in which also I was uh, deeply involved, in which we have not uh, discussed um, thus far, um, these were cases involving one company involving one or two practices which take uh, a long time um, and uh, uh, where sometimes you have the impression that the main interest is not so much whether the case makes a difference in the market but the fine that is being imposed the publicity that this generates for the commission, the image of uh, power that uh, this uh, reflects um, and all kinds of considerations, which I think detract from um, whether the commission is achieving something practical. We'll look at the Microsoft, uh, uh, the part of the case in which I was uh, more particularly in charge was a media player. Well, everybody knows that the remedy imposed by the commission actually <laughs> served no purpose. Uh, it was based on the idea that uh, um, OEMs would uh, jump uh, at the opportunity of uh, entering into an exclusivity arrangement with a, a media player vendor and share the benefit of the income generated by that media player. Uh, but there was very little analysis about the feasibility of that model because the media player vendor earn so little money that they have no interest in sharing their meager income with an OEM uh, and uh, because downloading is so easy. So, I mean, that business opportunity 
that the commission created in that market turn out to be uh, illusory. So in fact, it was a lot of effort to achieve essentially nothing. And I heard that as far as the other aspect of the case is concerned, the uh, inter interoperability information for servers, I mean, no server was built using that information. So you could see, you could say that this whole effort, this whole case, several years of litigation produced no practical results. So I can understand that then instead of going after one um, giant uh, tech company after the other, focusing on one or two practices of that company um, with mixed results, um, the commission decided to take a much broader approach and saying we are not going to uh, go through the trouble of showing dominance, abuse, etc. We define a list of practices which we consider problematic, rightly or wrongly. Um, we define also, uh, well, um, broad, uh, um, well, we define exactly to whom we are going to apply this. We define criteria uh, by which uh, we select the targets of that uh, regulation. Uh, so again, we don't need to show that they are dominant. We just uh, uh, see that they correspond to parameters that we have defined. And uh, so we try to affect uh, the conduct, uh, to change the conduct of those companies without going through the trouble of uh, showing uh, dominance abuse and going, in fact, uh, only on a, on a case by case basis. So certainly this is more efficient, and I understand the logic of that uh, of that approach. You know whether it will work, whether it will produce results. Of course, time will tell. But I understand the Commission's frustration of trying to change uh, conduct in the new tech world by individual cases and replacing that with broad brush regulation. That doesn't mean that there will be no litigation. There is always litigation, but it will be on different issues, like whether well, you really meet the, the, the criteria. Um, 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 and um, so it, it won't be about uh, dominance. It won't be about, um, well, does it correspond to the concept of abuse? Um, you have practices which by regulation are defined as being well illegal or at least uh, uh, having to be uh, um, corrected um, and so you you know you eliminate a lot of uh, um, parameters on which litigation uh, is possible so there will be litigation but i think less burdensome for for the commission if I may elaborate a little bit on, on, on this point, based on, on your description, exposition of the history of competition law, uh, of EU competition, but also EU law more generally, we know that the, the, the role of courts are as, not as political act, as proactive political actors, but as a decisive factor channeling or shaping the development of each specific policy or area of EU law in specific direction is significant. So do you think a lot would depend on the, the position of the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, on the DMM, DMA, whether they will say, okay, we understand that uh, the legislation has been adopted in a very pro-enforcement fashion. We give the marginal discretion to the, to the commission, particularly in the first years where you want to calibrate the parameters, et cetera. Go on, the challenge, the, we sense that there is a need to, for something of this kind, do experiment, and maybe then afterwards we will try to put some limitation. Or the, the second scenario would be, no, 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 you're doing this wrong, you didn't, you didn't understand your own uh, draft and then the legislation itself, pausing, delaying, re re reinterpreting. Does the court have this possibility? Does the court have this ambition? Does the court have this vision? How do you understand the role of court in this, in this whole system? Well, the court um, 
have essentially been re reactive. Uh, because one thing that always uh, uh, struck me uh, in the debate uh, about modernization of Article 102, uh, people saying, well, we cannot do that because this is inconsistent with the past case law of the court, like Hoffman, La Roche, etc. I was telling them, you know, this. what is this case law? Uh, it's a mirror. <laughs> in which you can see the reflection of your past policy. Of course, La Roche, it's the commission finding that uh, 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 exclusivity rebates are illegal and the court upholding that finding. And so the court is is reactive. The, the, you could say, yes, but then how could you explain Intel? Uh, Intel is the court taking into account all the inputs received, seeing also that within the commission, there is a, um, a battle between two factions. Um, and uh, so it's a divided house. And the court at one point deciding that, well, it's time to work for a change and embracing the position of one of the two factions. Um, so it was not like a total revolution, the court coming up with you know, its own ideas that nobody else uh, had uh, expressed before, and you know, essentially <laughs> you know, uh, turning the table. It's the court essentially considering that the the status quo was no longer um, feasible, and so the deciding that the previous case law had to be clarified in a very subtle way. Um, so I think that uh, on this new regulatory uh, uh, effort, the approach will be essentially the same. I mean, the, it's not the, the court that defines the, the, the commission's policy. It's for the commission to decide how it wants to apply uh, the, the rules. And especially here, we have a regulatory context. It's not like the normal case where you have a company found guilty of an abuse being fined for that. Uh, you are in a quasi-criminal context. Here, you will be in a of course, it could be become quasi-criminal in case of infringement. But in the meantime, you are in a purely regulatory context where I think uh, the court will recognize a broad margin of discretion for, for the commission. Um, it will be a totally different uh, litigation uh, climate. Uh, of course, again, time will tell, but I, I really don't believe that the courts you know, would say, no, you cannot regulate. Uh, no, that's the court just reviews the legality of the commission's actions. It does not uh, uh, decide uh, what the policy uh, should be. That's for but the, the commission. commission does, supposedly. The commission, the commission it, it does, yeah, that's its function. And, and it looks uh, and to me the, that with, <clears throat> with this discretionary a room for interpreting obligations, particularly Article 6, but not only with specification decision, but even more so in the UK, where the CMA will be designing obligations ad hoc for each specific designated undertaking, the, and with limited resources, the discretionary elements are self-evident. So yes. you have to do prior priorities in, <laughs> in pursuing some cases, non-compliances by stress and in your interpretation, etc. And thus, you have to be probably, I imagine, underpinned by some strategic vision or some um, whole broader regulatory agenda. Do you think who should inform this agenda? Does the commission, uh, how flexible, does the commission have this con consensus within itself? And what are the main elements in your view? I also link it to, the, to your recent report, which you have co-produced, co-authored uh, for FIDE where these issues were somehow yeah. present in this broader constellation of factors shaping yeah. EU digital competition policy. Yes, 
No, I, I think that uh, this is really uh, for the Commission to determine. And uh, what I sense is that there seems to, within the, the not just the, the Commission, but also all the institutions, because this, this is a regulation which was uh, adopted uh, uh, through the legislative process, there seems to be a consensus, a broad consensus uh, on the wisdom of the initiative and also on its content, which was uh, well discussed, negotiated among the the institutions. Now, um, of course, I have myself certain questions about you know, the wisdom of some of the practices which have been put in the list of uh, practices to be changed or to be uh, to be abandoned. Uh, you know how for some of them there was some previous uh, uh, judicial experiences uh, but for others not uh, so there is room for debate there but i think that it will be first and primarily a policy debate more than a legal debate because i think the court has no choice but to take the regulation as it is um, and um, uh, its intervention uh, when uh, you know the issue is not the conduct of the company but you know the existence of the regulation and how it should be interpreted uh, I think it has less leeway uh, than in a traditional litigation about an abuse committed by one specific company where it can annul based on a mistake etc uh, here it will be, you know, I think the margin of discretion clearly is broader for the Commission. I also wanted uh, to ask Jean-Francois the question, you, you, you traced the evolution of EU competition law and there were several phases in terms of expert knowledge and the techni technical details mm -hmm. uh, of the field. So we started with broader mandate, which has been then con concretized and getting sophisticated refined mm -hmm. um maybe a little bit too sophisticated for 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 some so we definitely sense the pushback uh the, trying to find other ways do you think we went too far with this or this for example with merger cases having so so in so so much information generated endlessly or is, is, there is no other way to do it no, on, on merger, because indeed this is something that we have not discussed thus far. Um, <clears throat> on mergers, uh, the turning point was uh, uh, 2002 uh, uh, when the, uh, well, you had these three judgments of, of, of the court, um, uh, Air Tour, um, uh, there was a, a Tetra. Uh, Tetra Laval, Sidel, uh, Schneider, Le Grand, uh, where which stopped an evolution within uh, the uh, the merger task force, which was created only in, in 1990, uh, but uh, with a slow start. But then was taking increasingly aggressive uh, uh, stands uh, on on mergers. Uh, and uh, this was well. This led to this well, trilogy of of of, uh, of cases. These three judgments where the the, the commission lost, uh, and for one of them, not just at the court of first instance level, but also court of justice level, which caused the the commission at the time it was uh, Mr. Monty to disband the merger task force uh, to create the post of chief economist, and then followed a period uh, where the commission was much more careful in approaching mergers and where you could see a, some kind of alignment between the approach followed in, in the EU and the softer approach followed in the, in the US under the influence of the Chicago school. Um, and then, well, we are now in a new phase where also under the influence of, of some new hipster 
ideas, as they were called at one point, ideas uh, in the US, at least under the current administration. Uh, there is a, this tougher approach on mergers, uh, killer acquisitions, etc. Uh, but, uh, and indeed, so we see much more aggressiveness on the part of the Commission. Now, uh, a problem uh, that has existed uh, even under the soft approach of uh, followed until a few years ago is indeed the amount of information that is requested from from the parties, uh, the process which is extremely long. Sometimes the pre-filing uh, discussions uh, taking more time than the actual uh, uh, review process under under the regulation. And uh, certainly improvements could be uh, could be made uh, uh, there. Um, the uh, this is something uh, I think which is a source of concern for for a lot uh, a lot of people. But as far as the trend is concerned, yes, the current mood, not uh, just in Europe but also in the US, again under the current administration, is that uh, the merger control policy should be uh, tougher, and especially uh, concerning big tech and maybe also the pharmaceutical sector. Um, and uh, so I don't see this changing in the short term, at least uh, not in Europe. And maybe my, my final question before going to traditional, uh, asking you for recommendation to, to, to students and uh, r recent graduates who search for, uh, for their place in this constellation mm -hmm. of very, very important policy. Um, another kind of new um, vocabulary in the field is polycentricity, the, which is kind of antonym to technicization, which was focused on discovering the truth with capital mm -hmm. T, whatever the economic wisdom would tell us about this economic truth. Now we somehow find ourselves in this um, multifaceted uh, sector where different factors have different currencies. We don't have exchange rate, how to convert them necessarily into our parlance, into our metrics. It's quite a new situation. Or oh, at the same at the same time for constitutional lawyers, and I imagine for lawyers in general, it's not necessarily new. We, we, it, uh, it's normal essentially to to balance with this, this incommensurable things. Do you think it's it's something which which uh, is gaining momentum? And what what are your comments about this new new or maybe quasi new situation? Well, of course, what we we hear, and you know, I attended. Uh, <clears throat> Well, two conferences uh, this year, one recently in uh, in, in Berlin, uh, the Bundeskartellam conference. Uh, and before that, there was the conference organized by uh, Christina Kafara, who has become a, a very uh, a famous uh, uh, leader of, uh, well, new, more aggressive uh, approach to antitrust in fact reflecting also some of the ideas that you new ideas that you you hear uh, in the in the us um but at the um, um the conference uh, the christina Cafaras conference in brussels uh, in february uh, there was olivier Gerson, and he made uh, a comment uh, which was uh, heavily criticized by a lot of people on this uh, camp of uh, new activism um, uh, on the competition policy. Uh, he said, um, for some people, competition um, is uh, the problem, for others, it's the solution. And then, then he said, but for me, it's a side dish. I think that probably he meant a side show. Uh, but well, the idea is clear. It's well not something which um, is really uh, at the center of our current big, uh, much bigger problems like uh, the environment, uh, the geopolitical uh, uh, issues, etc. And I tend to agree with him. Um, the uh, 
so when you look at the place of of competition uh, in within the commission um, in the past this was the most sought after post within the commission um, because the, you know, everybody normally knew who the commission president was but very few people or maybe nobody knew exactly who the other commissioners were except the commissioner for competition because he or she appeared on the in the press or on television so announcing those big fines those big uh, battles with the giants of this world etc so projecting uh, power and uh, uh, this was the because this was the only field in which the commission had direct enforcement powers and uh, by 1997 uh, somebody in the international press uh, described Mr. Van Meert, the commissioner at the time, as the most uh, powerful man in Europe. Today, nobody <laughs> would say that uh, Mrs. Vestager, you know, is the most powerful woman in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, because <laughs> the most powerful people have now a kind of seen more, much more sinister face. Uh, but uh, competition policy, I think, has has lost its uh, preeminent position. It's still there, and certainly it will continue to be enforced, and it will continue to be a big thing. Um, but um, it will, I think, in certain areas, uh, take the second uh, uh, place to more important uh, policies. For example, on uh, well, the environment, I personally think that the the current guidelines on uh, um, environmental agreements uh, are too strict. They should be uh, softer on those on those agreements um, uh, also in the field of uh, state aid you see there is a relaxation of the rules uh, subsidies for uh, strategic investments in uh, cheap uh, production uh, etc you know are being accepted uh, um, so various aspects of the the police comp competition policy which has been followed by the Commission thus far, will have to be adjusted to uh, ensure that they do not stand in the way of, of bigger and more important policy objectives. So that is, I think, a factor that will uh, play a role in determining the place of, of competition policy among all the, the Commission, the commission uh, policies. And within within competition policy, you know, I uh, I refer to this Olivier Gersan's remark, which I think is is very wise. Uh, it's a I don't see how competition policy by itself, you know, can solve uh, big problems. Uh, in in the seventies, people thought that. It could solve inflation. Uh, <laughs> of course, this turned out to be uh, very wrong. Uh, and uh, I, I really think that it's a, a kind of minor uh, policy. Uh, there are much more important economic policies to be pursued. An import, it's an important policy, but I, I, I think that the current evolution of uh, what the Commission does, uh, extending its range, uh, uh, covering issues which nobody would have thought about just one year ago, like defense now. So I think this puts competition in its play, because at national level, competition policy has never played the role that it has played at EU level. But that was because of this well, uh, the fact that the Commission had so limited powers in such a limited number of fields, now that the Commission starts looking more like a real government covering everything, uh, including defence, uh, possibly, 
then naturally, you know, competition's uh, relative importance will shrink. It's not a bad thing. You know, it will not disappear, but it will certainly have a different position in the spectrum of policies in the future. This is also really a good thing. You know, having to think about defense is a, evokes uh, memories of the past, which we thought would never come back. Uh, um, but um, um, I think it's a reality. Uh, but it shouldn't, I imagine that students and graduates shouldn't read the law or hear uh, the last sentences of, of, of this conversation as a discouragement no. <laughs> to join the field. But no, no. I wanted to ask specifically, you obviously yep. such a such a senior figure in the in the area you see the job market continuously you see the trends you see some features which newcomers have to possess maybe they are stable maybe there, there are some changes maybe there is something missing in the market which you would somehow give a tip to to to, to youngsters and they, they still have time to to train that muscles yeah well um no, to, to answer your, your first question, no, I mean, the, as I said, even if in the broad, uh, you know, uh, uh, spectrum of uh, a broad scheme of things, uh, competition policy will have to compete itself with with other other policies, it will still continue. And certainly when you, we see uh, how it is applied to the, the tech uh, sector, it will continue to play a major role. So there will continue to be employment for young uh, lawyers and uh, economists in that field. But since things are moving so so quickly, you know, I you must there, there are not um, that many additional things that you should do other than obtaining your degree following uh, courses uh, uh, and seminars uh, where you learn about competition law and you see you discuss you debate how it is applied so as we always used to do for <laughs> as long as i can remember uh, and then after that, uh, you need to just uh, adjust to whatever happens. Certainly, but that has also been true. Uh, also, if you if you have a technical background, um, um, well, if you work on on cases involving big tech, if you have a good knowledge of that uh, industry and some of its techniques. That is uh, useful, but I think that also that these are things that you can learn well on the on on the spot, as we have uh, always uh, always done, and uh, be alert also. Uh, that will be my message to the students. Well, the competition law is really a U.S. invention, <laughs> uh, and it's always useful to to look at how it is applied over there especially now since uh, everything seems to be boiling uh, at least for the time being um, so um, keep an eye on on what is going on in, in the us that's essential keep an eye also on the the national uh, experiences and then just you know swim in the river you know uh, following the, the flow and the current um the many certainly there will be uh, more more diversification in in the practice the the dma uh, is introducing a new regulatory dimension in something which was essentially a case or block exemption uh, based um, um so no the, the, there is i don't I, I would continue to recommend people to uh, to study that field and try to to work in that field. And I, in Brussels, I see the number of lawyers uh, working on this uh, uh, increasing, not uh, not not decreasing. 
So, but it's, it, I think it's probably a, a more exciting sector because of all the uncertainty now than uh, it has ever been uh, in the in the past. Because you see trends and ideas going in in very opposite uh, uh, directions, and 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 there is really a, a debate, uh, a kind of ideological debate uh, uh, currently going on, uh, uh, and uh, yeah. as reflected in. You know, I also uh, had the opportunity to attend these both events to which you, you refer to and uh, having a few conversations with, with some participants, I have noticed something which was not very noticeable in the past that they, they, they say openly, I specialize in, in private private enforcement damages for, for, for one specific kind of uh, case. Do you observe such narrow uh, specific specialization even further within the discipline? Oh, oh yes, um, and and I would say that um, when you are uh, in the field of private uh, actions, um, and uh, there are of course now vehicles which you know, bring those cases. So uh, when Nelly Croves said that we have to be careful in Europe not to import the excesses of the U.S. system. But I think that we created our own uh, excesses. So we have private uh, instruments uh, with investor money uh, uh, funded to to bring cases on a contingency uh, basis for victims of of, of cartels, um, and of course, and they need to work. So you have the actual uh, uh, vehicles themselves uh, who employ people. And then you have the law firms assisting them. And if you are in that line of, of business, then you choose a camp. You cannot at the same time sue companies for, for damages um, because of their participation in a, in a cartel and uh, then trying to assist them when they are on the, on the defense side. Though, some lawyers have told me that they sometimes work on those cases and sometimes uh, work for the other side, even uh, defending uh, those cases. But certainly there is enough work in that kind of uh, cases to spend all your time on that. Now, this may be a dangerous specialization because one day the music may stop uh, there. There have been less cartel uh, cases thus far, so less of those uh, private actions. So it's always good to be able to jump into another area. But yes, so th there is this new market which has been created uh, and uh, which employs a, a number of people who would, uh, you know, <laughs> not be doing that uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, just like uh, also I hear about people and only working on well just one big tech uh, company's uh, issue uh, so you you have no there is there is there is a lot of, of work in, in in areas which did not exist uh, not that long ago when I, I look at uh, uh, some of my past cases, uh, there is one case which I would like to mention as an example of uh, how uh, you can sometimes win a case, uh, not through your own argument, but uh, through um, the, the process. Uh, which uh, leads to the to the judgment, and in in, in this case is wood pulp. So this famous case where the court, uh, this is the last time that they did that, decided to appoint economic experts to test uh, the commission's argument that the market, the wood pulp market, uh, as they could observe it, with periods during which uh, prices were very stable and were uniform um, and other periods uh, there was a high diversity of prices uh, lack of uniformity was a market which functioned properly only during those periods where the prices were very different 
And during the periods where there was price uniformity, uh, the only explanation for this uh, situation was the existence of a concerted practice. And so the, the Court of Justice um, decided to appoint uh, economic experts to test the Commission's position. In fact, they could have avoided that because uh, the Commission had no evidence of contacts between the companies. So the Court could have said in the absence of contacts between uh, companies, there is no concerted practice. To have a concerted practice, you need evidence of consultation, and there is none. But the court decided to go one step further and to test the economics supporting the commission decision. And in that case, I thought that one way of winning the case, we represented one of the US defendants, uh, was to ensure that the economic experts would be well chosen. What I wanted to avoid was um, uh, a panel of experts or one expert uh, only bringing um, academic uh, knowledge uh, and uh, uh, we're trying to find out well, what was wrong with the market? Well, why the market was indeed behaving in a way which looked inconsistent with economic models? I wanted a panel in which there would be um, an economic expert who would try to explain why what the situation was was instead of trying to find out what it should have been. And so there was a discussion among the parties about the selection of experts, and there was at the end a compromise between the commission and the parties under which there would be one uh, strategy, one uh, academic expert, and then there would be one uh, expert of the industry concerned, the wood pulp industry uh, concerned. And I thought this was very important to have somebody who could understand and explain to the academic expert why things were the way they were. Because for me, it was absurd to think that the market would function properly only when uh, all the prices were different, but also all the prices were below cost, when the companies could not make a profit. And um, so we succeeded in having this team of experts, one academic, one economic expert, and when uh, the uh, experts explained their uh, analysis of the market, uh, well, I realized that there was no need to argue anything, no need to plead, because they explained something that none of the experts appointed by the parties were sometimes very famous. Uh, experts like uh, Alexis Jacquemin, uh, at the time one of the specialists of uh, microeconomy, of industrial economics, uh, none of them had come up with the very intelligent, very clever, and totally unexpected uh, analysis of the market produced by the two court experts. They said, well, this market is uh, at the same time um, an oligopolistic market and at the same time also not. It is an oligopolistic market in which you have uniform pricing during certain periods because each customer buys from only uh, three, maximum three suppliers for technical reasons. So each customer and the suppliers are like a kind of mini oligopoly which are able to practice uh, oligopolistic pricing as long as the market is in balance. And since wood pulp can be stored, uh, it's not perishable, the companies make sure that the supply uh, matches the demand. And so as long as there is this balance, there is oligopolistic pricing each quarter during a certain period. But of course, at one point, there is too much uh, uh, in stocks. 
So they have to release those supplies. That's when supply exceeds demand. That's where prices collapse, are below cost. And once that period ends, and there is again balance in the market, there is again this system of oligopolistic uh, pricing. Uh, extremely clever, extremely brilliant. It's an oligopoly, and at the same time, it's not. It was not. There were at least 40, 50 suppliers, and it explained everything. And that's on that day, our case was, was won because of the economic exploit. So sometimes you win a case not by the quality of your um, eloquence, but uh, by the right choice of uh, experts when the court decides to a point some something that it hasn't done as far so it's <laughs> that was the 90s and uh, but uh well this was uh, uh i still remember the day the these two experts presented their their theory uh if, uh, everybody was flabbergasted it was so brilliant and and, and nobody else <laughs> had thought about it Jean-Francois Abelis, thank you very much for this very informative conversation. No, no, no. Thank you also for giving me this opportunity to go to travel in time with you. <laughs>